I'm glad to be here this morning. I'm gonna be honest, it's been a very rough week for me. And I share things like this with you all just to encourage each of us in our faith, amen? We have to stay strong and trusting the Lord even through great trials and problems. And so, you know, this week I found out I can't wear my contacts right now. I have a problem with my eyes uh, due to allergies most likely. I've had chronic idiopathic hives for 10 years every spring, but they've never gone past my legs. And I'm in a full outbreak of hives that are going up my body, cannot be controlled. I'm on new medication. My blood sugar is through the roof. I'm not sleeping. And yet I got up yesterday morning and I said, I just knelt beside my couch and I said, Jesus, please have mercy on me. You have to help me. I just, I don't know what's going on here, but I'm trusting you. And I did one of those things that I don't always recommend people do. And that is to open up the Bible and say, Lord, wherever your hand, you know, leads me in the Bible, I'm going to read that verse. And I kid you not, here's the verse that I opened up to and my eyes directly went to. In Romans chapter 4, verses 20 and 21, about Abraham. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Amen? And so I got up from a time of crying and weeping before Jesus, and I said, I'm still going to serve you. And this morning when I woke up and the hives had continued to spread, I cried, and then I said, I'm going to preach because the devil doesn't want me to, and I know that. Let's do this. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. We are just going to look at one verse this morning. How many of you know, though, I can string out a verse pretty long? <laughs> Some of you are sitting there saying, well, I think it's only one today. Sometimes when it's only one, those messages actually go longer, okay, because it's a really good one. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. How many of you know that's one of the most celebrated verses in the Word of God? And we read it so often, and we cling to it, and we love it, but my prayer this morning is it would not just be a platitude for you, but that you would get the reality of what the Bible is saying in this powerful, powerful verse. Amen? All right. I've titled the message, and I did this to draw people in. This isn't the only question that this message is going to answer, but so often people will say to me, do we lose our memories in heaven? In other words, how are we going to not have any sadness if there are loved ones and friends that are not in heaven with us? What are we doing with that information from life on this earth? That's what we're going to answer today. So I pray that the Holy Spirit touches each one of us, amen, and brings the healing and the strength that we need. Father, I come before you, and I know that it is nothing that I could ever say or do that would ever change a heart. But I know your Holy Spirit can. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for encouraging me this week through the testimonies of others, how they are coming to Jesus. And I pray, Father, this morning that this message through the live stream, through the recording in this sanctuary today would bring a comfort that is beyond our understanding and that it would bring an excitement for what is to come when we finally exit this world and are directly in your presence. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, here we go. <clears throat> One verse. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's an incredible statement, isn't it? Anybody cried as lately as me? I cried in the back of the sanctuary, okay, so you probably haven't cried as lately as I have, but 
I'll tell you what, this is unbelievable to think that we'll have no need to cry ever again. Never to shed a tear, never to sob, never to have sorrow. I love how John MacArthur says this. He says, we are all familiar with the feeling of pain, fear, or frustration welling up from deep within and spilling out through the tear ducts in our eyes. This process can be healthy in the broken world in which we live as we release negative emotions by weeping. How many of you know God designed us to do that? It's a release. Praise God, however, there will be a day in which the source of those tears will be gone and we will never cry again. Only joy rises up from the deepest place of our hearts. Only joy, peace, anticipation, and a comforting love such as we have never yet known. What it declares is the absence of anything to be sorry about. No sadness, no disappointment, no pain. There will be no tears of regret, tears over the death of loved ones, or tears for any other reason. And you know, one thing that God really struck me with when I was reading this in light of the week that I've been through is when John MacArthur says that feeling that just it wells up within you and suddenly it has to spill out. You've been holding it in for so long. Anybody ever been there? The fear, the frustration, the sadness, uh, you're just on overload and you don't expect to cry, but suddenly... It spills. That's what happened to me in the back of the sanctuary, talking to Connie and Kathy. It's what happened to me yesterday when I visited my young friend, Taya, and, and I went to her room and I said, Taya, I just, I'm going to ask you to pray for me about what I'm going through in my body, if you would. And as I started to talk to her about what was going on, I just started bawling. And, you know, it just came out. And I realized that it, it, it's something that deep, is deep down in there that comes out. And so many times we all go through this what struck me was the exact opposite will happen in heaven. Every experience you have will never be that what comes bubbling out from the bottom is sorrow or frustration or fear. What comes constantly bubbling out from deep inside your heart will be joy and peace. That is incredible to think of the opposite happening in heaven when there are no more tears. It, it led me to think of Psalm 42, 1 to 3, and I'm sure you've heard this before. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Do you realize what David's saying there? When do I get to be in God's presence? How many of you have ever prayed that? When do I finally get to be in God's presence? Then David says, my tears have been my food day and night, while all the time the enemy is saying to me, where is your God? That's an incredible psalm, isn't it? And it really cooperates with what we're studying in Revelation. Because David's longing to be in God's presence while he's crying and weeping and the enemy is pressing in on him saying, where's your God? And honestly, I believe one of the reasons God's allowed me to go through this in the past week or two is because I feel this in a very real way and the Holy Spirit can use me to preach this. I mean, there have been times where I said, where are you, Jesus? I cry out in the middle of the night, God, please have mercy on me. I need to sleep. You know, have you ever done that? And you think, where are you, God? He is there. Amen. He is there. But one day, we're going to see this come to fruition because David said, I want to appear before God, and the enemy's saying, when are you going to see your God? Where is he actually at? How many of you remember last week's message? Okay? Remember last week. If you didn't watch that, go back on YouTube and get it. But remember this. I was thinking of this when I read the psalm. Right now, the Holy Spirit's presence is dipped into us, and in the new heaven and the new earth, we will be dipped into God's presence. It will, he will surround us completely and be in us. That's a hope. So the answer to the question that David asks, it's coming. Amen? It's coming. And when we are surrounded by his presence in our new and glorified bodies, we will never cry again.
The, this is a promise. This is as true as John 3.16. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, as I was looking over my message, I added this piece because this is so interesting to me. I never thought of this before. Not only will there be no tears in heaven, but the Bible promises that there will be nothing but weeping and sorrow in hell. So just a word of warning to those of you who are blowing off the message of Jesus Christ or resisting the conviction of the Holy Spirit when you hear the word of God saying, oh, can that possibly be true? Or I don't really need him. I'm here to tell you something. As great as the promises of heaven are, so are as damnable what is going to happen in hell. Let's look at this verse. Jesus said in that place there will be what? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the gnashing of teeth, you know, that happens when you're, when you're in a set of, uh, you're uh, feeling regret, right? You're feeling such extreme angst and you just, what do you do? Grit your teeth. I mean, I was driving the other day and I could, my hands were on my steering wheel so tightly from anxiety that I was like, I got to, you know, that's gnashing of teeth, sorrow, tears. And so heaven is exactly opposite of that. Hell involves eternal regret, eternal sorrow, and being eternally uncomforted. Imagine feeling the pain and sorrow and guilt from all of your life, not just for an instant, not just for a day, not just at a level where you can try to distract yourself, but feeling the guilt and separation from God forever and ever and ever with no distraction to dissipate that feeling. Can you imagine? That's hell. Stark, stark difference because heaven is a place of eternal joy, eternal peace and comfort from God's own hand. And I know we can hardly imagine it as we're down on this earth and the devil does not want you to even try to imagine it. But who enjoys imagining it? Who likes to go above your level of current understanding and trust in the God who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, right? That's why we need to be in the Word of God and reminding ourselves of what heaven really is. Now, the next statement that's made is that death shall be no more. J. Vernon McGee, you know, he's, he's something else the way he writes. So listen to what he says about this. He says, people are dying all the time. There is a continual march to the cemetery. I once knew an engineer who in the early days had a great deal to do with the planning and plotting of the great freeways, which crisscross this country today. I asked him, is it going over the mountains or down through the valleys or crossing the rivers that's the biggest problem for you? He replied, the big problem is trying to miss the cemeteries. This earth is a great cemetery today, but all of that is going to end. There will be no burying ground in the New Jerusalem. The undertaker will be out of business. Isn't that beautiful? We all know it. Unless the rapture happens, every single one of us is marching toward the day of death. For the Christian, that's the day that you are finally set free. Amen? But death is the last enemy that Jesus must destroy. And so it is painful. But in heaven, can you imagine in heaven never having to think about sickness or death or wearing out or wearing down. It's incredible. Death will be no more. Paul corroborates this. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53, one of my favorite chapters, 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says this. Now, he's speaking of the rapture here. Who's excited about that? This is a rapture scripture, but the rapture scripture explains to us what happens to this current mortal body that we live in. So let's look at this. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Now sleep there is a euphemism for death. And I just want to pause because so many times people will write to me and say, I really appreciate that little thing you taught me about how to understand a word in the Bible. Okay, so I want to pause and remind everyone 
that when Paul uses the word sleep, he often means death, and it's a euphemism for death for the Christian. Because who in this place understands and knows that when you die, it's not the end of you? You're just closing your eyes to this world and waking up in the next. Amen? So Paul says, here's the mystery. We're not all going to sleep. In other words, not every person will end up having to face the grave. There is a generation of believers who will be raptured out of here. That's a grand hope. He says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In other words, whether you go in the rapture or you died a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the one thing that you share in common with all other believers is you get completely changed. Your body comes out brand new. Whether it translates instantaneously at the rapture or you come out of the grave or out of the urn and you're translated then all the same. Isn't this beautiful? And here's what he said. The trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised. What does it say? Imperishable. And we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on what is imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. Now listen, perishable there in the Greek is a word that really means not able to be corrupted. You know, when you, you buy a new car and you think, oh, it's a brand new car and you're all excited. And then two years later, you're like, oh, it has a dent, it has a scratch, something in the engine's rusting, you know, the brakes are wearing down. That's corruption. You know how when you're young, you think you'll take on the world, and as you get older, things don't work the way they should? That's corruption, okay? This is literally saying this corruptible body, this body in which things can wear down, wear away, and can start to not work right, is going to put on the imperishable. And this mortal must put on immortality. In other words, this body, which can be it can disintegrate, it can die, it can go away, is going to put on immortality. And when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Isn't that beautiful? One time I drew a graphic of that, and I should have blessed you with another one of my artistic drawings. But anyway, I drew like a bottomless pit, like a big V that's like a bottomless pit. And I said, okay, that's victory. And death goes down that pit and is gone forever. Just swallow it up in victory. When we get to heaven, when we finally die and lay our eyes on Jesus, I want you to know that everything is going to be swallowed up in victory because he is the victor. Just like Connie was talking about watching the coronation of King Charles, when you see the celebration there and the stateliness and the cost and how emotionally kind of moving it is, can you imagine when we see the greatest victor of all? Death will be swallowed up in victory, all sadness, all sorrow. Death shall be no more. John Phillips, on earth during the millennium, death will be rare. But it will not be banished entirely. Remember, those who live in mortal bodies, right? They could still face death, but they'll live longer. In the eternal state, death will be a thing of the past. There will be no more funerals, no more graves, no more hospitals, no more broken homes, no more broken hearts. What a day of rejoicing that will be. Thank you, Wally. Amen. Just say it out because it's what you feel in your heart. It is God's truth. I wrote down this in my notes. We remember that the only reason death will be gone is because our Jesus faced it on our behalf. The author of life yielded himself to death so that dying creatures may one day know a life without demise. That's incredible that the author of life submitted to death, even though death could certainly not keep a hold on him. Jesus said, I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Now, the word of God goes on to say, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. 
Now, um, when we combine this with the fact that he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes, there are a lot of people, and, and again, we can consider this a kind of gray area in the word of God. We don't have to divide over what we believe about this. But I have run into many Christians who believe that how both of those statements are true in heaven is when you first get to heaven, you will know and remember unsaved loved ones and all the bad things of life. But then God comes and he wipes the tears from your eyes. And essentially what he's doing there is wiping away your memory so that you would have no reason to mourn or cry or have pain anymore. But how many of you does that not settle well with? And there are people who honestly believe this. Well, when you get to heaven, I, I mean, I even had someone posted on my page just the other day when I was just talking about preaching this sermon and said, well, we're not going to remember those loved ones. Just be like they disappeared. <laughs> okay? And that's what I want to get to here is we're going to get deep in this and figure out, do we really lose our memories? How can it possibly be that we could be who we are in heaven in a new and glorified body, in the presence of God, and never have reason to mourn or cry or have pain, even if so-and-so, for example, is not in heaven. Right? And a lot of you may be sitting there thinking, well, Shelley, if I still can have memories in heaven, I'll remember how I was abused. I'll remember all the horrible things I went through, and that will give me reason to sorrow. Well, let's just, we're going to talk about this. What about the memory of loved ones who are not in heaven with us? Now, first of all, what I want you to notice, always my rule of thumb is read the Bible not just for what it says, but for what it doesn't say. Notice this verse does not say he will wipe away every troubling memory from their minds. It doesn't say that God is going to reach down into your brain and take away, you know, 75% of your memories, because probably 75% are bad, right, in this world, and he's going to leave the other 25. Because we know from a logical perspective that we are who we are as a result of an accumulation of memories. Stay with me here for a minute. So many people will say to me, Shelly Prindle, you know, I just love how you preach. I just love how you're deep with the Lord. Blah, blah. You know, and, and I appreciate all that. And they'll want, I wonder how that came to be. And I've told you this before, and I want to reemphasize it. It came to be because I faced a lot in my life. It came to be because at 13 years old, I was, you know, in a coma, diagnosed with a life-threatening illness, and that's traumatizing at age 13. And my whole life changed. And at the young and tender age of 13, I was thinking about how precious life is and how little we have down here and how we need to put our eyes on heaven. That is one of the things that stirred me to study the Bible and to know God more is because of a very bad thing. Amen? Who believes blessing has been brought out of that? That's just one example of many tremendous ways. And in all of our lives, God has made us into who we are. Primarily, the Bible says, through our trials and heartaches, we get to know him more. Amen? So when I get to heaven, am I going to like forget that I, was, that I ever had a disease? Forget that that ever happened to me at age 13? Well, that would be ridiculous. When I get to heaven, I think like when I stand in God's presence, I can't imagine how glorious it'll be, but I'll stand in God's presence and say, wow, while I was laying in that ICU bed, you were, God's going to show me just how he was drawing me closer to himself, what was actually going on in the spiritual realm. And also when I get to heaven, God is going to introduce me to people who've come into his kingdom and are in heaven because I did preach his word. And as I begin to meet all those people, I'm not going to separate that from the fact that God is going to also say, see what all your suffering has brought. Now, how would I be able to rejoice if I didn't know the truth of how God worked every bad thing for the good? 
We want to cling to Romans 8, 28 all the time. God works all things together for the good of those. Do you still want to cling to it when you get to heaven? Well, you have to know that there were things he worked together for the good. But you'll finally know exactly how he did. Now, as I'm standing here preaching this, and my body is very itchy, I'm asking God, how are these hives? Am I going to remember these hives in heaven? I do believe that part of the glory of heaven will be to see how every bad thing was worked for God's purposes. Amen? We got to hold on for that. I'm going to, I'm going to give you more details because I've had people bring this scripture up to me. Isaiah 65, 17, in the Old Testament, God says, Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. And everybody, oh, we'll see, we won't have any memory. We're going to forget everything. And it's, and we're, listen, that doesn't make sense in any way, shape, or form. If God were to wipe away your memory, and there would be nothing of the old life to know in heaven, we would not even be who we are. Okay, now I'm going to explain this further. And when the Bible reads, the former thing shall not be remembered to come to mind, in the Greek, what it really means is, the former shall not be remembered. Not like former things. We take it and we think, oh, well, this thing won't be remembered or that thing won't be remembered. But what God is saying in a broader sense is, in the new heavens and the new earth, the former way of being will never be known to us again. Does that make more sense? The former way of living will be totally never remembered again. In other words, in heaven, I will never remember what it is like to process a heartache without understanding of how it glorifies God. Okay? The way of existing... The old way of being will never be brought to mind. Even though I'll still remember how God used things, who is thankful that I won't process them the same way anymore? Amen? They won't cause me to weep anymore. Everything will cause me to rejoice. God, you did keep your promise. You really did work everything together for your good. Down here, I was exasperated. Down here, I couldn't figure it out. Down here, I wanted to give up hope, but you really were. See, that's how the former will never be remembered. You'll never process the same way again. You can't because you will be surrounded with God's Shekinah glory in a new body, with a new mind. So let's explain this a little further. The Bible goes on to say the former things have passed away. So when Isaiah wrote former things or the former shall not be remembered or come to mind, Revelation says the former things have passed away. But in context of what we've been studying, we know that the things that are being referred to here that will have passed away are the old heavens and earth, right? We know that for sure. That's corroborated all throughout the Bible. And the other thing that will have passed away is our non-glorified bodies, right? When we're in the new heaven and new earth, we got a brand new body, sinless and undying. So when it says the former things have passed away, it doesn't mean everything that ever existed, all your memories pass away. It means the old heavens and earth and the way things were run down here has passed away and our non-glorified bodies are mortal, misunderstanding, dying, sinful tendency bodies have passed away. Okay? Now... When it says they pass away, remember, they're being made what? Being, being made new. Now, this is another thing you have to remember. When it says that the old heavens and the old earth pass away, it doesn't mean that there will be no heavens and earth. It's just going to be made brand new. God doesn't throw away what he makes. He he's not sitting up in heaven saying, well, the devil and all those people ruined what I made. I better throw this world away and let me just start from scratch. No, the Bible is clear that he's going to make this world new. He's going to purge it by the fire of his holiness and make it new. Amen? And who of you are thankful that you are going to be able to hug each other in heaven because it will still be you? God doesn't say, oh, that old Shelly, she messed up. Let me just totally destroy Shelly, and I'll clone her and make a new one for heaven. Do you understand that's not what heaven is? 
I stay Shelly. Amen? But I get fixed. I get to be brand new. So when we think of old things passing away, we get to get out of our mind that it means that they just disappear. They are remade. Your whole way of processing will be different when we get to heaven. Praise God. So former things. I want to make sure we understand how that verse fits in. A few points to consider before I give a final explanation on this. First of all, our resurrected Lord will be in the new heavens and new earth with the nail scars still in his body. Right? In his resurrected body, didn't he invite the disciples to see and touch his wounds? That was his resurrected body, by the way. Because when he ascended, the Bible is clear that the angel said, this same Jesus, not a different one, the same one that ascended is coming back again, right? That was, The body he left in had scars. Now, if we get to heaven and we have no memory of our sin, the fact that we were ever sinners, when we look at our Savior with scars in his body, what are we going to say? Hey, how'd you get that? Do you understand how ludicrous this type of thinking is when you really whittle it down? I've often said the beauty of it is none of us will have scars in heaven precisely because we will always be looking at his scars, which paid for ours. Amen? I'm not going to look at Jesus in heaven and say, why do you have that, that scar in your side? Why are there nail scars in your hands and feet? I mean, he had those in his new and resurrected body. You and I will have resurrected bodies that have no scars. Praise God. But when we look at his in heaven, we won't be like mystified. Well, I wonder why he has those. Because, you know, what, you suddenly forget that you were a sinner who needed salvation? That's the greatest point of rejoicing in heaven of all. That a sinner like me could have been saved and paid for by him. Amen? Second, in what are we rejoicing in heaven if we do not remember that we had been saved from sin and hell? If you get to heaven and you have no idea that Jesus did all this for you and saved you from an eternal hell, if you don't have knowledge that hell exists, how would you be rejoicing that you're not there? Amen? If I've suffered so long with a disease down here, that's going to be part of the reason that my joy in heaven is greater because I've known what it was like to have a broken body and I will rejoice all the more in a new one. Amen? This is, this is what I'm trying to tell you. Even memories of bad relationships and, and terrible things, we will process them differently. But part of our rejoicing in heaven will be to know that used to be, but now look at this. That will make the celebration all the greater. How many of you know we take everything for granted until it's gone from us? And all I want right now is normal skin. Do you know what I mean? And I realize all the days I complain about stupid things when I am sitting and able to just do something without itching. Magnify that infinity and think about all that you will rejoice in because you know what you've come from. And you never have to fear. You know, you say, well, well then I might, I might be afraid that it'll happen again. You, no, that can't happen. It's a new way of being. It's a new heaven and new earth. It's a new and glorified body. Your mind will work differently. Your body will work differently. There's the eternal assurance that it's never going back to that. Amen? So many times we might get temporary healing or relief or something good might happen in life, but then you're always on edge thinking, when's the next thing going to hit? Am I the only one who does that? Am I the only Christian who's actually going to admit that I do that? Yeah? Never in heaven. This is incredible. And third, who would we be without the accumulation of our memories? God has used everything that you have been through to make you who you are. And some of the people who I see love Jesus the most and are the greatest evangelists, are people who've really been down some dirty roads. And God has saved them. Amen? Our memories make us who we are if we allow God to shape us through them now and then one day understand them fully. 
When the Bible says the former things will pass away and that we won't remember them. Remember when Isaiah said we'll remember them no more? Kind of think of it this way. When Jeremiah 31, 34, when God says, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. I mean, if you know that's in the Bible. Does that mean that God is not aware that you ever sinned? I know I'm bringing some logic to this situation, but think about it. When you read that, does that literally mean that God's memory has been wiped clean of the fact that you were ever a sinner? Of course not. God knows what we are. It's that he chooses not to remember them. It's not that he's not aware of them. He chooses to set that to the side in light of what his son has done. Amen? But of course, he still knows that I'm a sinner. Every day I'm on my knees. Lord, pr I'm praying, help me. Help me with my sinful tendencies. Well, how could he do that if he's up in heaven and the slate's been wiped clean? He doesn't even, shall he sin? I didn't know she ever sinned. Think about it. Is that what the Bible means? It says, oh, no, it means he chooses not to count it against me. He chooses to process it in the light of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Not that he doesn't know I'm a sinner. Well, when we remember the former things no more, it doesn't mean we're not aware that somehow it's just been completely gone from our minds. It means that we will be able to process it in light of what Jesus has done and who he is. Amen? But we're not fully able to do that down here. I want to end this message with... Something some of you may have heard a piece of this before from another seminar I did. If you did, don't answer out loud any of the questions. If you never have, you're allowed to answer. You ready? I explain this in terms of mathematics. Math really does reflect the heart of God, by the way. Math is one of God's purest languages and ways of showing us his consistency and who he is. And I mean that in a very serious way. I've, I've gone to teacher conventions and taught teachers how math reflects God. It's really incredible. But I just want to share with you one thing. You, if you can keep this thought in your mind regarding memories and what we'll know in heaven, remember, heaven brings divine completion. Now just hang on to that for a minute. I'm going to show you what I mean. I take this from 1 Corinthians 13, 9 to 12, just briefly. How many of you know that Paul said, we know in part and we prophesy in part? Anybody ever remember reading the scripture? Right now on this earth, we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Because now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Now just taking the context of this, I want you to think about something. You, you know, unless you're Levi sitting here, right? We're not children anymore. But even Levi can go back and know that he was once two or three or four years old, right? And we all can longingly go back and remember when we were teenagers, you know, when things... All right, think about that. When you get to be older, does the child of you, is it gone? Then what did Paul mean? When I became... When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. He's not saying my childhood was taken from me. It's just I didn't act and think and reason like a child used to reason. The child is still in there. Amen? We're an accumulation of all of our growth. So in context, I want you to understand, the Bible says right now we only know in part and we preach or explain in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, what does the Bible say? The partial will do what? Pass away. Then I'll know fully instead of partially. Let me explain this to you for just a second. Again, if you've seen me do this before, don't answer. If you haven't, I want you to answer. I have put a math problem on the board, students, and it's not a hard one. One-fourth plus three-fourths. 
Does anybody know the answer? What is it, Levi? What? One hole. Very good. How many of you would agree with Levi that that's the correct answer? You'd be right. One fourth plus three fourths equals, what would you write in your test paper if you got that question? What would you put? A big old one, right? Everybody knows that. You're right. I want you to think about something. Is the answer also four fourths? Is it, Levi? Okay, because you're still in school and you can verify this is true, right? One-fourth plus three-fourths actually is, technically and most precisely, four-fourths. Because we were, t we were referencing pieces here. So if you really wanted to give an answer that's really technically precise in light of the context, you, one is correct. But if I really want to make myself clear and I want to say, well, I had one fourth and now I have three fourths, now I've got all four pieces. Doesn't that feel good? Now it's, I've got one, but I've really, so if I had written one tenth plus nine tenths, it would be more precise and you'd feel better about yourself. Wouldn't it make you feel good if you said, well, once I only had one of the nine Lego sets that I wanted. And now I got, you know, a one of the 10 Lego sets that I wanted. And now I got nine more Lego sets, all the other ones I wanted. So now I have all 10 of the 10 that I wanted, right? So the answer here is one, but technically it's four fourths. Here's my question for you all, and this is a deep philosophical question and part of a seminar that I teach. Why is everybody's first inclination to say one when it's also four-fourths? I've gone all over the place and shared this teaching with people. I've never once had anyone in any session raise their hand and say four-fourths. Never. And yet four-fourths is the answer. And yet you're right for saying one. So can anybody tell me why? It's, it's easier. Once you add the two fractions together, get the common denominator, isn't it much easier and wrapped up real nice to just say one? Four fourths is equal to one. Amen? When you were in school, after you moved from integers or whole numbers, and then you had to start learning fractions, adding and subtracting, subtracting fractions, getting common denominators, right? Uh, multiplying and dividing fractions. Wasn't that so much easier than whole numbers? No, we don't like fractions. Let me just tell you, we hate fractions, don't we? And I'm a math teacher and I don't even like them, okay? Why? Why does our mind always want to go to an integer, that's the technical name, rather than a fraction. Well, why would we rather have a whole mind than a schizophrenic mind, a divided mind, right? We have been rigged by our creator to desire completeness. We like integrity. Do you know the word integer, which is something that is not a fraction, okay, like two, three, four. Do you know the word integer in math comes from the same root as the word integrity? Do you know, you know how, what I teach on that? See those fractions up there? Man, if I put, if I put a fraction up there and I said, what is eight elevenths plus 112, 140 seconds? Like if I put those two fractions up there, I said add those together real quickly in your mind, how many of you would say I can't do it in my brain, right? What if I put up there 112 plus five, two integers? Well, you could try to do that in your brain. You might be able to, right? Fractions are what? Complicated. It's like what you see is not really what you get. You're not, you, you, when I say to you, what is eight forty thirds? You're in your mind, you're trying to think, well, first of all, how, how much does 43 pieces of pie look like? Let me picture eight. You're, right? Isn't that kind of hard to even picture? But if I say, what is eight? You're like, eight. I, I get that. I know it. Why? Why do our brains process integers better than fractions? I submit to you that this is why. 
We were designed to be complete. We were designed for integrity. Do you know what integrity is? Integrity is what you see, is what you get. How about that? Integrity is what you see, is what you get. I'm no different in front of you than I am anywhere else. This is me. That would be integrity. Wholeness. It's what God wants us to have. It's what we long for. When you're a fraction, you're hard to figure out. You ever been around people, you're like, eh. that was you Monday, that was you Tuesday. You're with them and you're like, I'm talking to you, but I don't really know who's talking back. Anybody ever talk to someone like that? That's a sign of something. Something's amiss. We don't like that. How many of you like to talk to somebody and you're like, I know, I know who he is. Even if that person is bad. In my opinion, I would rather deal with somebody that I know what they are, even if they're as bad as all get out. I want to know what I'm dealing with. Amen? That's why we like whole numbers. We like completeness. Our mind naturally goes to completeness. So that is the number one, but it's also four-fourths. Stay with me here. Your child's having a party for their birthday. Have a couple friends over. You get a pizza. Pizza's got 12 pieces in it. And your child runs to the table. And isn't this what they say? We're so hungry, Mom. We're going to eat 12 out of 12 pieces of that pizza. Is that what they say? No, what do they say? We're so hungry, Mom. We're going to eat the whole thing. Again, why? There are 12 pieces of pizza to be eaten, but our mind goes to the whole. I believe that's because that's the way God rigged us. I believe that's why math reflects that. But completion absorbs incompletion. It does not annihilate it. Now, you ready? Here's the aha moment. When you say you're going to eat that whole pizza, if it has 12 pieces in it, have you actually eaten 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12? Yes. You called it a whole. Because all of a sudden, when all the pieces are there, it becomes a whole. When I say what is 1 fourth plus 3 fourths, and you say 1, I say to you, is 1 fourth included in the 1? Then why aren't you talking in fourths anymore? Why, when all the parts are there, do you quit talking in fractional form and you all of a sudden say one? Because completion absorbs the parts, but it doesn't annihilate the parts. It brings all the parts, say it with me, together. I hope somebody's feeling this in your spirit. Heaven doesn't take anything from you. It puts all the pieces together. Heaven does not annihilate our memories or our understanding of what's... It just makes us know that it's true and that it's right. And when we stand in God's presence, the pain will disappear because we'll stand in God's presence and we'll begin to see things from his point of view. And somehow, I know we can't imagine this, this side of heaven. We will honestly be able to say, I see God now. Why? That person could not be here because that is truly who they are and that is truly what they want. And that is the dignity you've given them. And somehow, in the glory of God's presence, those broken pieces will not hurt us anymore because all we'll be able to see is the what? The whole. Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence is what? Fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. It's full and it goes on forever. What does that mean in your... Presence, there's fullness of joy. Listen, I have so much joy right now preaching this message to you that every once in a while as I'm preaching, my own problems creep in and steal just a little bit of the joy. Have you ever had that happen? 
You ever had like a, I can remember things like it's Christmas morning, you know, you work for months to get Christmas exactly what it should be. You buy all the right presents, you put them all under the tree, get all the kids together celebrating Christmas. And one of the kids comes down with like the stomach virus, Christmas day. You're like, okay, well, this is joy, but it's not fullness of joy, right? In life, that's how it is. Any perfect moment is invaded by problems from the past, issues that are at hand, worries about the future. Amen? Too much. But in heaven, no moment will ever be incomplete. It will be fullness of joy. It's like, I've told you this before, I want you to remember, it's like holding a candle to the noonday sun. We have this much understanding. We're holding a candle right now. We say, oh, well, I don't possibly see how I could have joy in heaven if I know so-and-so isn't there. I don't see how I could have joy in heaven if I remember this or that, or that won't make sense. And, and all your knowledge is summed up in one little flame on a candle, right? If you were to take that candle and hold that flame up to the noonday sun on a cloudless sky, what do you think you're going to see? The candle flame? Or is the sun going to burn your retina? Right? Everything that we know and understand is like a candle flame. And when we hold it up to the noonday sun of God's glory and how he really worked everything for our good and how hell is just and right for those who have willingly rejected him and don't want him, all of a sudden we'll be like, the picture is complete and it won't trouble us anymore. So he who was on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And then he said to John, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Now we've read a lot in Revelation 21, 1 through 4, all these glorious promises crescendoing with, I'll wipe away every tear from your eyes. There'll be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. And I want to share with you why I believe God said, when he said, I'm going to make everything new, I want to share with you why I believe then the Holy Spirit had to kind of interrupt what he was doing and say, write this down, John, for these words are trustworthy and true. Now, John is taking notes of his vision, right? He's been writing the book of Revelation on the Isle of Patmos, and God tells him all this information. And when he gets to this part about no more suffering, no more tears, nothing like that, it's almost as if, here's what I picture happened, and I'll ask John one day in heaven. I think he was taking notes. God was telling him all this stuff, and he's writing down notes. You know. And then all of a sudden, God says, I'm making all things brand new. I'm going to wipe every tear from everyone's eyes, and death won't even exist. There'll be no sorrow, no mourning, no pain anymore, because the old things have passed away. Behold, I'm going to make everything new. And John, on the work-labor camp island of Patmos, probably deprived of clothing and food, taking down these words. You know what he probably... If it was me, this is what I would have done at this point. I don't think I could have absorbed that all at that moment. Isn't it almost too much to take in? And I feel like at that point, John probably just went, what? You know, he was stunned in a good way. He was just mystified. And I think God then had to say, Hey, John, pick up your pen, okay? Get back to it. Write this down, because these words are trustworthy and true. I know it seems like it's too much to believe, John, but write it down. And who is thankful that, be, that God has promised that those words that John wrote down so long ago are still true today? The promise is as good as done the Bible says all flesh is like grass, all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. The word of the Lord remains forever. That promise is as true as it's ever been. And I'm going to go back here and just read to close, and then we're going to pray. I'm going to read this last quote from J. Vernon McGee about this. He's going to make all things new. This is more meaningful to me than anything else. I don't know about you, but I've never really been satisfied with this life. I've found myself frustrated. I've found myself hemmed in. I've never been able to accomplish all that I ever wanted to accomplish. Does this resonate with anyone? 
I've never been the man I've wanted to be. I've never been the husband I've wanted to be. I've never been the father I've wanted to be. I've never preached the sermon that I've wanted to preach. I just do not seem to have arrived. All accomplishments seem to have a blot on them. But he says to me, as he says to you, I'm going to make all things new. You're going to be able to start over again. I'm waiting for that day when all things are going to be new and I can start over. Have you ever stopped to think about the potential of starting out all new again, of learning all over again and never ceasing but going on into eternity? Oh, the potential and capability of man in his sinless state. We see here the glorious prospect of all things made new. We can start over. There'll never be an end to our growth. Remember that of Christ it is said, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. There is constant growth and development. Just think of the prospect of that for the future. Someday, I don't know why this just gets to me when I read this. Someday I'm going to know something. Today I don't. But I will then. We know in part and we prophesy in part. And for all that we know, how many of you can just summarize it by saying what we know is nothing? I essentially could stand here and say, someday I'm going to know. I don't really know anything right now. All I'm doing is trusting God's word. But one day, knowledge won't be taken from us. Knowledge will be made complete. Amen? Praise God. Father, thank you this morning for your word. Thank you for meeting us here. Thank you for touching hearts online and in this place. I want to pause and give anyone an opportunity who has never turned to Jesus for the forgiveness of sin and the way to the Father and heaven. If you have never done that, please call out to Jesus. In your heart or get alone somewhere, say it out loud. Say, Jesus, I want my sins forgiven. I want to be right with the Father. I want to be in that new heaven and new earth in your presence forever. And Jesus will be faithful to answer the sincere heart. I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.